Our next speaker is Philip Cranen, who's a research associate at RWT Jaffa University in Germany. Uh, here he's a member of the Data Management and Data Exploration Group. His research interests include data mining, screening, uh, any kind of any kind of applications, and energy efficient data dissemination. Today he's going to talk about clustering, indexing microclusters from any kind of screen mining. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, also welcome from my side. Um, first of all, I'd also like to uh, thank the organizers for uh, giving me the opportunity to present our work here. Uh, it's been a very interesting week seeing all the different views and uh, approaches to data streams and stream uh, processing. And um, I'll try to give you a brief overview of how we approach the um, domain of stream mining um, and what our contributions are. So the usual way I start my, my talks are by giving examples of data streams from like real life, and this is one of my favorites here. But I guess um, in, in these uh, sessions I, I can skip over that. So there are some from um, from industry, like surface inspection and, and monitoring applications, uh, sensor networks, like body sensor networks, or spread out somewhere. We have plenty of examples already over the week. So the, what I finish with usually is then that basically everywhere uh, where data is continuously measured and sent somewhere. Uh, we have a potential application for um, stream mining. And then we have this fancy uh, landscape of, of applications where you find all the nice pictures there. And we have some uh, tasks from a data mining perspective, from a machine learning perspective, which would be our classification, for example, modeling, which, uh, which refers to clustering as well, <coughs> or outlier detection. And it's, of course, um, not, a, not, a, not a crisp um, categorization, but they uh, can be applied somewhere, somewhere else. And um, one part that we are focused on or that we are interested in is the differentiation of the streams into categories of constant data streams where the data rate is given or fixed over a long period of time, as in uh, many of the industrial applications, and um, streams of varying data rates, um, as you usually have everywhere where like, users are involved or um, sensors are involved that um, only set measurements when like values change significantly, or uh, sensors um, come into the network and go out of the network, and so on. So that um, results in varying data streams, and that's something that we focus on, and that I will talk about a little bit more in the talk. So that's the structure of the talk. There was uh, three parts. Um, obviously, we do like frameworks. I also have a framework in the end, but it's only going, going to be one slide. Um, the other two parts are first the um, the principle of, of any time algorithm. So, what is an any time algorithm? I don't know whether uh, you all are familiar with that. I want to motivate it a little bit um, for uh, the stream data mining. And then in the second part, it's going to be one of um, the uh, methods that we proposed and uh, forgot to say this in collaboration with uh, Ira Asen from, from Denmark and my colleagues from RWTH. Okay. So, just to clarify things, a stream for us is just an infinite sequence of tuples, probably as many of you also see that we have a timestamp and a feature vector. And then we have the what we call the inter-arrival time. This is just the time between two consecutive stream items. And that's what makes the difference then, uh, in our case, between the constant and varying stream. So for a constant stream, just this inter-arrival time is always the same. Let's say, I don't know, 20 milliseconds. And then for algorithms that work on streams, um, they generally all fall into the category of online algorithms in the sense that they have to process the input one at a time, so um, they do not have random access to the data. Uh, then um, if the algorithm is tailored to a specific amount of time, say, um, you know beforehand, okay, I have 20 milliseconds to process an object, that would, that's what we call a budget algorithm, because it knows beforehand how much time it has. <laughs> and then there's the category of any time algorithms uh, which do not know beforehand how much time is available. And just one more slide on that. Um, if you have a budget algorithm, and as I said in the example, you have uh, 20 milliseconds, what happens if you have less time available, so there is more data coming in? That would mean that for, for that data item that arrives before, of, in, in the less time, then you would, would not be able to provide a result. And if there is more time, you would still finish after 20 milliseconds, and you would have idle times. The question we like to um, pose for our students or anywhere, where we have the possibility is uh, how should stream processing ideally be done? And, and, and um, the answer is, to, to us is rather straightforward that if you have little time, you want a fast result. And if you have more time, you want to use that time and do not 
want your machine to be idle, so you want to use that time to improve, improve your result. And it's shown there on, in, the, in that picture. So you have a short initialization, you get a first result with a certain quality, and if you have more processing time, your result will improve. Um, a good example for this would be any time classification, where the accuracy of your classifier improves if you have more time on average. And then just the definition, uh, core point of any time algorithms is that they are interruptible and can provide a result after any amount of time. Okay, um, now some people say, okay, that sounds like a nice idea, but um, I have an application and we have uh, constant data rates, so maybe these, these industrial applications, uh, why would we bother or why would we need any time algorithms? So the scenario is here as follows. I again have this um, example with the bottles. So they pass a camera at some point in time, uh, TF, so the features become available. And at some other point in time, TD, you have to make a decision. That is, you have to either sort them out or they can allow to pass or whatsoever. Um, in this case, usually you would have this kind of budget algorithm. Say you have 20 or 50 milliseconds per bottle. Um, you tweak your algorithm and use all the available time that you have. The question is, can we do better than this? The answer is, of course, yes. The idea is, again, fairly simple. Uh, the idea is to distribute the computation time according to a confidence in your decisions, right? So for some bottles in this example, you might be um, pretty sure with your decision early on. Say, okay, the bottle's broken, I've got to sort it out. You can use the rest of the computation time on other decisions where you're not that certain. And for that, you would again um, need an algorithm that can deal with different time allowances, and of course, in this case, a confidence measure for your decision. And now uh, we are not the only ones working on that. Um, most important point is probably the, the hint on the bottom of the slide. Um, there are a couple of references on the, on the last slide. So there's, for classification, there's lots of um, work being done. The first ones from, from 2002 on any time support vector machines, those are actually ICML papers. There are a couple of ICDM papers and, and lots of people, or some people working on that. And um, not only classification, but also uh, learning in an any time manner. Um, it actually all started out in the artificial intelligence community for, for robot navigation. It was in work done by uh, Mark Body already in 1987. And then there's anytime clustering, anytime outlier detection, and I'm going to talk a little bit about anytime clustering in the second part, which is where we are already. So the technique that I will present here uh, is called the, the clues tree. Um, it's um, an approach for anytime stream clustering, and um, I will s switch briefly to the. Uh, to the framework to show you what, what, what we're going to see or what the technique is going to do in the end, and I hope this is not yet yeah, is working. So these are, these are um, points and noise generated, and there are some <coughs> clusters, uh, the colored ones that we want to track. And on the right hand side, we see the result of the actual algorithm. So you have uh, all the uh, green small clusters uh, belonging to the noise. And if I do not show the points, we see that the algorithm is actually very much faster. You see, like, the number of processed points up there. Um, and this is why we draw and evaluate everything. So that's, that's what we want to have in the end with the technique. OK. So problem statement for the algorithm is that we uh, want to perform clustering. Uh, I guess I don't have to motivate that uh, too much. Uh, we, we, we want to reduce the amount of data or provide an overview or group similar objects. And in the streaming scenario, um, usage is often as a, as a pre-processing step, so you, you generate are more clusters than you would actually need for, 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 for what you would consider as, uh, as clustering, as you know, from, from like static data sets. So um, this is often called microclusters. Like you generate several thousands of microclusters, uh, keeping um, summaries of the data that arrives on the stream, and you use that as input for further analysis. Maybe uh, like, a, like a, a second offline clustering algorithm or any kind of analysis that you would like to use. Okay, and there are several challenges. You've seen a couple of these over the week, and also in the talk by Professor Nasrari. So we have a single pass only. Uh, there's limited time, limited memory, evolving data. And um, yeah, we would not like to um, fix the number of clusters beforehand. So the algorithm should be able to adapt the, model, the size of its model according to the amount of data that's arriving on the stream. Um, and that's, um, 
those are the requirements or the sorry the goals that we want to reach with our techniques. So we want to uh, create an anytime algorithm and have a fine-grained uh, result as an input for further analysis. We want to be compatible to existing work on drift and novelty detection, as we've also seen in the talk of Professor Nasrari and his other existing work on that. And as I said, the self-adaptive model size. And here again, we're not the only ones um, doing stream clustering. So there's uh, lots of approaches, especially since uh, 2000, in, um, in all of the data mining conferences and community, there is a lot of work on uh, stream clustering. There are convex methods, density-based and grid-based methods, and, and all kinds of other methods. Um, some of them like, sh share, uh, share parts of their approaches, so whether they process the data in chunks and then merge the results of the, of the clustering in the chunks, or whether they maintain a list of clusters and then decide whether to throw away some old ones or create some new ones depending on the data characteristics. And what most of them have is an online and offline component. So the online component generates the, the microclustering, as I already mentioned, and in the offline component you perform the actual real clustering that you would then um, like as a representation of your data distribution, or the offline component could be any other thing um, that's of interest for your analysis. And of course, um, that's why we were able to publish this. Um, they, they are all not any type algorithms, and uh, they, all of them have to be given um, a model size in advance. So that, that means like a maximum number of clusters or a fixed number of clusters that they maintain. And that is, if the data rate is less, then they, um, well, they, they naturally have these idle times that I mentioned in the beginning. And due to the fact that they um, check an incoming point to all the clusters in their list or in their representation, um, the result is not very fine, yet, and you will see um, more on that in, in two slides. Okay. Most important point here is that all of the approaches have to restrict themselves to the worst case time allowance. And this, what, what I mean by that is, is again the point that you have to say, okay, um, in the worst case, I have that many data points per time unit, and I have to be able to still perform my clustering, while if, if there's times where there's less data coming in, this results in idle times, and this is something that uh, we would like to address, and what we did address. Okay. Same goals, just restated, we want to perform any time clustering, we want to have an adaptive model size, so we do not want to restrict ourselves to the worst case, time allowance, finite representation, and the compatibility to the work on, on uh, drift and novelty detection, as we've seen in the talk before as well. Okay, here's the basic idea. Uh, the method is called plus tree, as I said, and it's it's a tree. Um, we use cluster features to represent the microclusters. This is a very common approach. I mean, cluster features are um, already been used in the Birch um, clustering method. Whether someone knows that. Um, cluster features basically store the number of objects in the cluster, uh, the linear sum per dimension, and the the square sum per dimension, and from that you can compute statistics like mean values and variance of the cluster. So it's very useful, and uh, actually that that's suffices to be uh, compatible to the existing work on, on, on drift detection, novelty detection, because you can provide those statistics as input to the methods that, that say, okay, some change occurred there. All right, um, we maintain a balanced hierarchical data structure, so a balanced hierarchy of those cluster features. And what we do is we simply insert a new object into the closest subtree. So it's a, um, for now, straightforward um, depth-first descent. Uh, and that's, that's one key to why we have this fine-grained representation in the end. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, we do not go through all the list of the microclusters that we maintain, but we have this hierarchy above as an index structure where we have um, a faster access and, and, and thereby can maintain more, a large number of microclusters. <coughs> Now, the insertion will stop as soon as the, the next object arrives. So that is, if we have less time, the insertion will stop somewhere within the tree. If we have more time, it will stop somewhere lower in the tree, then eventually we might reach the leaf level. And that's the first part of how we uh, realize the anytime um, property of the algorithm. And then, of course, the most detailed model will be in the leaf. And if there is continuously more time available, so if more objects reach the leaf level, um, 
additional entries will be generated and the nodes will be split and the tree grows. That means the model grows and that's where we get the um, self-adaptive model size. So if there's times where there's less data arriving, we can descend further in the tree, the tree will grow and then our model will grow. And vice versa, if um, the stream is faster, we will only uh, come to a certain level and uh, due to the aging, which I will explain in a couple of minutes, um, the old entries in the leaves uh, will go away and the model will adapt again to the fast stream. Okay. Now, um, there's uh, two more slides on the structure and then there's some, some results and uh, that's basically it already. Um, we have the hierarchy of cluster features. New objects, so the, the uh, feature vector of the object, is simply added to the cluster feature, so we increment the number, we add the <coughs> per, per feature uh, the linear sum and the quadratic sum. And um, as I said, if the next object arrives, we stop the insertion, and that's why we have this uh, buffer. I don't know, but I'm sorry. Um, I don't want to move away too far from there. Um, so an inner entry has uh, a cluster feature on the left hand side that represents all the data in its subtree. It has a pointer to the subtree, and then it has this second cluster feature which represents the buffer, or which is the buffer um, that aggregates all the points that have been interrupted there um, during insertion, right? So once again, if the next object arrives, arrives, we stop the insertion and we store the object in the buffer. The leaf entry is only a single micro cluster since uh, we don't need the buffer there. And now, um, the interruption is only the first half, as I said. So we buffer the objects, we aggregate them in the buffer, and then uh, the second part of the algorithm is what we call hitchhiking. So we resume the insertion process once we have um, once we come along the same way with another object. And since we aggregate the objects in the buffer, um, we always maximally have two objects to descend with. Okay, and I have a little example here. So the blue object on the left to the root node there will be our insertion object. And here on the second level, the red symbol is a filled buffer, and the arrows on the bottom indicate where the objects belong. Okay, then we first descend to the second level and then um, see that we have to descend to the left. We give this buffer a lift, so we, we perform this hitchhiking operation. And then whenever we have different ways, we buffer it again and descend further with our insertion objects to ultimately insert it into the leaf. So that's how we um, perform the anytime clustering. We buffer objects when we are interrupted and resume the insertion once we pass along the same way um, later on with the second insertion or any insertion. Okay, and the tree grows, as I already mentioned before, by splitting leaf nodes. How am I on time? Five minutes? Okay. Okay, this is the, um, well, the, the main point is this is about how we keep an up-to-date view of the data. So we have also an aging function here that, that's, uh, that we share with many other stream clustering approaches. So it's an exponential decay function. It has very nice properties. And um, the benefits of this is, uh, on the one hand, that we can reuse insignificant entries, as I already mentioned. Um, so if there's, for example, uh, clusters that, that fade out or go away, then we can use these and reuse these entries and those subtrees uh, with new data. And um, the nice feature about this exponential decay function is that um, every cluster feature still exactly represents its subtree, even though we didn't update all the timestamps in the subtree. And uh, there's proof in the paper for that. This was the basic idea, and this is the uh, this is an overview slide of, of some extensions we did to that. So um, we experimented with with very well, extremely fast streams, which means on a single core we had um, 90 to 150 thousand points per second, which is considerably faster, <coughs> I would say. And then of course the quality can deteriorate if you always are interrupted on a very high level of the tree. So we um, experiment, experimented or investigated ways to insert aggregates instead of single points. Um, for slower streams, if you have, say, a limited amount of memory or, or like a maximal size of your model you want to maintain, then still, due to this depth-first descent, you might be done rather quickly and, and, and still have idle time. So for that, we have alternative uh, descent strategies that if there is still more time available, you indeed um, scan alternative ways through the tree or alternative microclusters 
to, to improve the actual um, um, yeah, clustering quality in terms of, of, um, of accuracy and stuff. And then we have some other things like uh, look ahead, which reduces the overlapping in the tree and some explicit noise handling, which is a very nice component, but that would take uh, too much time to explain. Okay, um, quick words on the results. Maybe you focus on the on the top right. This simply shows that with additional time, the the quality improves. So the, the measure of the purity in this case only um, improves, which is like the um, shows the effectiveness of the method. That is, if we have more time, we have better results. On the bottom, it's about the aggregation. I'll skip over that. And here we have a comparison only in terms of number of microclusters that we can maintain. Um, it's Fascinating on the one hand uh, that we can maintain so many, but it's, it's not fascinating if you consider that it's, it's this tree structure and the depth first descent. Of course, we have um, only a logarithmic number of, of um, distances that we have to compute. So we have an exponential number of uh, microclusters in terms of the, the number of distances that we, that we compute since we have this balanced tree structure. So in comparison to uh, our clue stream or dense stream, which we already um, heard in other talks, uh, you see that for around six to 7,000 points per second, um, they maintain 500 microclusters, uh, while we were able to maintain over 400,000 microclusters at 50,000 points per second. Okay, now the last uh, part and the last slide is only a single slide, is about the uh, a framework for stream data mining. So this is not only about stream clustering, it also um, has couple of algorithms for stream classification, uh, outlier detection on data streams, and so on. This actually started off at Waikato University in New Zealand, and um, we joined in about two years ago um, for the stream clustering part. So the software I showed before was, was this MOA framework, and the nice thing about it is, um, well, for certainly for people that develop uh, stream mining algorithms, they have a set of readily implemented algorithms there to compare against. We have a set of data generators and a set of measures. Um, so you can refer to that for your experimental section. Um, the same for, uh, well, not only for stream clustering, as I said, but also for classification. And also, um, well, we use that for, for teaching purposes. And um, well, if you, if, if you are more from the applied side, you can also go ahead and, and use the methods that are implemented. It's a Java implementation. Um, so uh, we do not support any like like R or, or C plus plus so far. Um, yeah, and it's 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 open source. You can download it. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, videos and tutorials, and there's a manual about 140 pages by now or something. But uh, good luck reading that. Yeah, the references I promised, and uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs> Can you fill in just a little bit about the creation of the microclusters before they're inserted into the tree? Um, sh sure. I mean, before, um, well, in, in the basic setting, there's just objects. So an, an object is represented by a, a feature vector. And of course, I mean, since in, in this, um, this case we, we compute linear sums and, and, and quadratic sums and so on, it's only continuous features. So that technique, as it is, is not for heterogeneous data, as we've seen in the talk before. There are approaches that handle both kinds of, of features. Um, so those are just objects, and then, um, well, initially we have a we have a root node, and then, and then there's uh, three cluster features there, and we simply add the objects to it. And um, if there's more time, we create a new one. And creating a new one is just it's a cluster feature. So then you have the number of points would be one, and the linear sum and quadratic sum is just the features themselves. So. There is no initial initialization needed or something like that. I see. Great, thanks. The cynic in me is wondering if you've got 90,000, 100,000 clusters, how do you use that for reforming decisions or how do you use that to make a decision or to get knowledge from all of this? Part one. And then part two is uh, in trying to put this might break down. If you've got 90,000 things flowing in every second, you're making microclusters. 
some of the things you want to read. Looks like it would just get triggered. Here's a completely new novel thing each time, even if it's very predictable at once a week. So, can you have some sort of way of being able to retain longer term knowledge? Okay, for the first part, um, the question was what do we do with this large amount of microclusters? Is that right? Okay. Um, as in other approaches as well, um, the idea is to have kind of online component which has. Um, summaries of the data that arise and then an offline component that performs your actual uh, clustering um, if you want to have, let's say, a, a distribution of your data so you might, might want to take a clustering method of your choice and configure that with like a hundred clusters or something. <coughs> so the idea really is to have a more or a, a, an input that is as fine grained as possible. So um, with these 90,000 clusters you would certainly not call that a, a clustering result as is uh, to, to give to any user to um, to look at it, that, that's certainly too much. It could be used as, um, as kind of a, a smart buffering approach, right? Um, that you say, okay, I want maximally 90,000 clusters per whatever every five minutes, and then you, you get those from it from your data structure. That is, if the data rate is too low, you will still get the single points, and if it's if it's way higher, you can you will still get all the points, but in an aggregated way, aggregated in 90,000 clusters, but still. So, um, yeah. I, I strongly believe that as an input for further analysis, the large number of microclusters is, is really useful. And um, the second part I didn't really get, so that's the long term. I, I think you answered it actually in what you just said. The second part? I, I think you actually answered it. Thank you. Okay, all right. 